Good morning, church. Good morning, and welcome to the fourth Sunday in the Lent here in Cass City United Methodist Church. If you can please rise with me if you are able for our opening prayer. Sweet and precious God, almighty and awesome in glory, yet so near and so concerned about our hearts, thank you for knowing and loving us with an everlasting love. Time and time again we have messed up and relived the oh so common, if you get me out of this, I will never do it again. We have attempted to bargain a favor on our promissory note that we make void daily. But thank you, God, even through you, know we are headed to sin again. You not only will still love us unconditionally, but you offer us forgiveness the opportunity to have a clean record, a get-out-of-jail-free card that bears the title, New Grace and Mercy Every Morning. So allow us, O oh God, to not become complacent in our daily journey. Forgive us for not moving as fast as we should have in the past, and for not helping someone in need when we could have. You have given us the spirit of discernment, but please give us the wisdom to see beyond the transitory things of life and find you and your sustaining presence that we may be a blessing to others. You know the sun cries in our heart. We know that you have already met the need. Now God tap into our heart's true desire. Touch families, friends, and most importantly, our neighbors. Because when you are blessing our neighbors, we know you are in the neighborhood and you are headed to our house. So thank you for being sovereign in our lives, giving us the power to speak over our own lives, the lives around us, and to love one another with the love of Christ. We will continue to give you glory, honor, and praise believing that your grace is sufficient enough for us and your love endures forever. It is in the matchless name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. We welcome Linda Miller as this week's musician and Morris Powell as this week's liturgist. Our opening hymn this morning is hymn number 496 in the Methodist hymnal. Sweet hour of prayer.
Good morning, church. Good morning, and welcome back again to in-house worship here in Cass City United Methodist Church. But we're also showing this service online at 11 a.m., and you can also listen in our parking lot by tuning your radio to 87.9 FM. Welcome to worship. My name is Pastor Bob Demianovich, and I'm the pastor here at Cass City United Methodist Church. And I want to welcome each and every one of you here to worship this morning, whether you're here in the church, online, or in our parking lot. As you can see from the signage when you enter the church, we continue to wear our masks. We wash our hands. We social distance and have our temperature taken. This is another occasion of Jesus predicting his death and the doorway that is open for all of us. And by another occasion, we don't mean how repetitive, but instead we mean we need to pay attention here. This is important. Worship then should be centered around the offering that Christ makes to all. So the song should be in praise of Jesus and the power of his sacrifice. The prayers should be prayers of thanksgiving for the gift of a life eternal, of forgiveness and grace. There could be witness to the power of a reclaimed life, of a renewed start or a healed relationship and healed bodies. But underneath it all is a call to commitment that is what look up and live means. Look up doesn't sound like much of a commitment, but it is a call to move out of ourselves and to allow someone else to take the lead, to take the center of our beings. Look up means see the hope for your own life and the lives of those you love, and indeed the whole world, not in yourself but in the person of Jesus Christ and his redeeming grace. How will you issue the call to commitment? What next steps can be provided so the folks understand that this is more than a moment at an altar rail? What groups, in person or online, are ready to take new attenders and walk alongside those who are ready to take up the call to look up and live? One of the many things we know about how to make disciples, one thing is clear. No one does it on his or her own. What kind of buddy system or group process can we begin to put into place for mutual support and encouragement? Here again, the worship team can partner with others in the life of the congregation to help commute the understanding that worship is not something we do for an hour or so once a week, but something we do every day of our lives. Amen. So now do me a favor, you know what's coming. Look at your neighbor, your family member, or your children, and say to them, I am glad that you are here. Now look at someone else and let them know that God loves you, and there's nothing you can do about that. That's right, there's nothing you can do about God's love because God loves you. And God loved us so much that he gave us his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins, was resurrected on the third day. As we approach our Holy Week and our Easter holiday, Remember that God loves you, and there's nothing you can do about that. For those of you who have your smartphones, please take them out and take a picture of our beautiful altar, or our stained glass, or someone who's in church with you today. Take a picture, post it on Facebook or Twitter, and let everyone know that church has reopened and that you're in church, whether you're here in the sanctuary or watching online. Now, if you're able to stand with me for our call to worship. 
In the midst of your hectic week, you have come to worship God. Our lives are pulled in so many directions, we seek God's guidance. Let go of the burdens that weigh you down. God will take them. We thank God for the respite we are given. Tune your hearts and voices in praise to God. Let our voices bear the joy we feel because of God's love for us. Amen. Now is the time of the passing of our peace. We place our hand over our heart. We wave to one another. We give the peace sign. But we stay where we are and we place our hand over our heart, sharing our Christian love to one another. Our response hymn will be number 347. Jesus said to his disciples, 
Things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day, and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. The apostle said to the Lord, Increase our faith. He replied, If you have faith as a small mustard seed, you can say to the small berry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, Come along now and sit to, down to eat? Won't he rather say, Prepare my supper, get yourself ready, and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink? Will you thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, We are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Christ emphasizes that each of us have an unwavering duty to both Christ and to our fellow believers. It's your duty to not cause offenses. We're not perfect as long as we are in this body, we will sin. In Luke 17, 1, Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. Thomas Carlyle, in 1785 to 1881, the greatest fault is to be conscious of none. In James 3, 2, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. In Ecclesiastes 7, 20, for there is not a just man upon earth that does good and sins not. In 1 John 1, 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We should live in such a way as not to snare others into sinning. Offenses will come, but woes unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone be hanged around his neck, and he be cast into the sea, than he should offend one of these little ones. No one's behavior is entirely his or her own business. Even slight departures from health have their unseen eventual consequences. In our day of prized individuality, and it's nobody's business, but my attitude, we trip each other up in more ways than we can recognize. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not, as it says in 1 Corinthians 10. He that loves his brother abides in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling into him. And the translation is, but what about when it's the other guy who offends us and trips us up? It's your duty to forgive offenders. When someone does trip us up, we ought to be forgiving. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, Forgive him. 
C.S. Lewis wrote, we all agree that forgiveness is a beautiful idea until we have to practice it. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The heaviest load any man carries on his back is a pack of grudges. You must choose to forgive whoever has wronged you. Forgiveness is not an emotion, it's a decision of the will. Furthermore, it is an act of obedience. Our forgiveness must be unending. And if he trespasses against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. A man complained to his pal that whenever he argued with his wife, she got historical. His friend said, you mean hysterical? He said, no, historical. She dredges up the past and reminds me of every time I failed her in the past. How often, when others wrong us, do we bring up the previous that they have offended us? It doesn't take a great deal of faith to do the job Christ has called us to do. It seems impossible to fulfill our duty. And the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. The disciples moved by the challenge of Christ felt that in order to meet these standards, they needed a stronger faith which would supply them with sufficient strength and grace to carry out the task set before them. C.K. Chesterton, in What's Wrong with the World, wrote, The Christian idea has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. God never calls us to do anything that He does not equip us to accomplish. Little faith will win the victory over self. As the Lord said, if ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto this black mulberry tree, Be thou kept plucked up and by the root and be planted into the seed, and it should obey you. The mustard seed is the least of all seeds, but when it's grown, it's the greatest among herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Genuine faith is what is needed, not great faith. The slightest real faith would be powerful enough to accomplish what seems impossible. Responsibility is my response to his ability. Just do your job. But which of you have a servant plowing or feeding cattle will say unto him by and by when he is come from the field, go and sit down to meet, and will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may suffer and grid myself and serve me till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. We are served the entire day and evening. I slept and dreamed that life was beauty. I woke and found that life was duty. A servant's duty starts with toiling the field. During the day, it often does not end at sunset when he comes in from the field. He often has further duties in the evening. I heard about a little girl who experienced a major breakthrough in her life when she learned to tie her own shoes. Her father asked, why are you crying? I have to tie my shoes, she said. You just learned how. It isn't that hard, is it? I know, she wailed, but I'm going to have to do it for the rest of my life. I believe there are some of us that feel the same way when it comes to Christian stewardship. We learn that it's exciting to give and serve, but there is just a tiny bit of dread because we know we have to do it over and over again for the rest of our lives. 
You are a tool in the hands of God. He demands your service, not your rest. Yet how fortunate you are that he lets you take part in his work. Therefore, my beloved brethren, but ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The reward of service is more service. We are to serve our master until he is satisfied. And would we not rather say to unto him, Make ready with wit I may suffer, and grid myself and serve me, till I have eaten and drinken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink? Contemporary Christian musician Phil Cady said, If you're honest, you know your calling to serve God, but before the lights are turned out and after they're burned out. And now, Israel, what does the Lord my thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. A charge to keep on hand a God to glorify, a never-dying soul to save, and fitted for the sky. To serve the present age, my calling to fulfill, O may it all my powers engage to do my Master's will. We are to serve whether or not we are appreciated or thanked. In Luke 17, 9 through 10, does he thank him, that servant because he did the things that were commanded of him? I think not. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded of you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. We need to develop the ability to serve even when the rewards are few and the accolades none. God calls us to be sensations. He called us to be servants. No matter what we do for Christ, it is our duty to do it. We are unworthy of the privilege of serving Him. In 1 Timothy 1, And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into ministry. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor, but he obtained mercy. First Philippians 2, 5 to 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made into the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient until death even the death of a cross. Amen. with care you count every hair your fingerprints make me unique and under my skin a something within a strength even when I'm weak I'm 
wonderfully made Your image displayed A light where no darkness can fall And when I am weak I know I'm unique I'm crafted to answer your call Here I am, you know my name Tell me I'm okay Drive away the fear and shame Standing in my way Here I am, you call my name Open all my doors Let me never be the same Take my life, it's yours Wonderfully made, your image displayed, a light where no darkness can fall. And when we are weak, we still hear you speak, we're crafted to answer your call. Here I am, you know my name, tell me I'm okay.
9.30, around 9.30 a.m. We need to tend to 12 volunteers on Tuesday, March 16th for this smaller pop-up pantry. We also have on March 19th our next soup, dessert, and bread takeouts. So we're asking you between 12 o'clock and 5 p.m. to come to the church and pick up your soup, your dessert, and your bread. The charge will be $5 per serving, and we are only doing pickup or takeout if you order six or more soups. This afternoon, Sunday, March 14th, is our at board meeting. This will take place via Zoom. So if you don't have a link to our Zoom uh, meeting, please call our office or call me directly and I'll make sure we send you a link to our at board meeting. The meeting will start at 3 p.m. this afternoon. Also, our next Lenten series for Bible study will be next Saturday, March 20th at 11 o'clock a.m. and links were sent to you. If you wish to join us for this Lenten study, just let Julie in the office know. These are just some of the announcements I have for the good of the church. I will ask you to be in a moment of holy silence, allowing for centering, settling, and focusing on silent prayer for life's challenges that we all face. So let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the wondrous ways in which you have healed and restored us. There have been countless times when we wondered if the trials and struggles of our lives would overcome us and swallow us up. Yet you have reached out to redeem us, just as in the scriptures when Jesus healed the ten people affected with leprosy. One, when he saw that he had been healed, Return to Jesus, praising God for the healing that had taken place. Make our faith as strong as the one of that man. Give us the wisdom to know the source of healing is not in our pleading, but in our acknowledging your love and your power. As we bring before you the names and situations in our hearts that are filled with strife and trouble, we ask for this healing as well. We ask for your prayers for the family of Don and Rita Green, who lost their daughter-in-law, Catherine Green, to COVID-19. Our sympathy to her husband Brian and her children, Amando and Wilfredo. We ask for prayers for the whole Green family. We also ask for prayers for Chuck and Michelle Earl and the Earl family as Chuck continues his recovery at home and is getting stronger with each every day. Also prayers for Ruth and Scott McClain as they recover from COVID-19. Prayers for Mike Vienna of Corona, California, who was diagnosed with liver and lung cancer. And prayers for healing. For Ruth Ann and Gary Riker as Ruth Ann heals from a broken shoulder. We also ask for continued prayers for Kirk Kaufman of San Diego, California, who is now cancer free. And Kirk Kaufman is Eunice Kaufman's son. Prayers work, so we ask you to continue to pray for them. Pray for Linda and Roger Marshall, Jane and Keith Mitchell, and Lois and Jack Gallagher, and Bob and Barkwood, Archie and Chris Allen, and Dick and Judy Wallace. We ask for prayers for Ivor Rockwell and 
Naomi Wallace, Dick Wallace's mom, and Kathy and Phil Nichols, and Shirley Weisenbach. I ask for your continued prayers for Ron Geiger and Dolly Minch, Ed and Judy Prophet, Bill and Shirley Zinniger, as Shirley continues her healing from a broken hip and collarbone. Prayers for Charles and Iris Tucky and Sandy David, Pastor Barry David. We ask for continued prayers of healing for Fred Bowden and his mom, Lorraine Bowden. For Daly and Linda Parrish, for Dean and Nancy Hutchinson. And of course, prayers for our congregation and our shuttles. We know that you hear the cries of our hearts and respond always in love. Help us to place our complete trust in your ever-ending compassion. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now is the time for our offering and our tithes. We ask that you continue to give your weekly, monthly, and quarterly giving. And if possible, come back to church on Sundays. We are looking for additional donations to our COVID-19 fund. Also to the pastor's discretionary fund. And of course, to our mortgage fund. So if you can, please give as often as you can and as generous as you can be. Great and generous God, our lives are surrounded by things that steal our lives, inflict and destroy us. The tithes and offerings we share with you this day are a way of keeping us focused, not on the things that would take life away, but will renew our lives. Hope, love, compassion, and empathy as the Israelites looked to a serpent on a pole for healing, we look to a Savior on a cross to be brought back to life. In that holy name, Jesus, the Messiah, we pray. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures, Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.
shield and old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross with the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll change.